Lesson 21. Daniel Mendoza. Listen to the tape, then answer the question below. How many unsuccessful attempts did Mendoza make before becoming champion of all England? Boxing matches were very popular in England 200 years ago. In those days, boxers fought with bare fists for prize money. Because of this, they were known as prize fighters. However, boxing was very crude, for there were no rules and a prize fighter could be seriously injured or even killed during a match. One of the most colorful figures in boxing history was Daniel Mendoza, who was born in 1764. The use of gloves was not introduced until 1860, when the Marquis of Queensberry drew up the first set of rules. Though he was technically a prize fighter, Mendoza did much to change crude prize fighting into a sport, for he brought science to the game. In his day, Mendoza enjoyed tremendous popularity. He was adored by rich and poor alike. Mendoza rose to fame swiftly after a boxing match when he was only 14 years old. This attracted the attention of Richard Humphreys, who was then the most eminent boxer in England. He offered to train Mendoza, and his young pupil was quick to learn. In fact, Mendoza soon became so successful that Humphreys turned against him. The two men quarreled bitterly, and it was clear that the argument could only be settled by a fight. A match was held at Stilton, where both men fought for an hour. The public bet a great deal of money on Mendoza, but he was defeated. Mendoza met Humphreys in the ring on a later occasion, and he lost for a second time. It was not until his third match in 1790 that he finally beat Humphreys and became champion of England. Meanwhile, he founded a highly successful academy, and even Lord Byron became one of his pupils. He earned enormous sums of money and was paid as much as 100 pounds for a single appearance. Despite this, he was so extravagant that he was always in debt. After he was defeated by a boxer called Gentleman Jackson, he was quickly forgotten. He was sent to prison for failing to pay his debts and died in poverty in 1836. Lesson 22 by heart. Listen to the tape, then answer the question below. Which actor read the letter in the end, the aristocrat or the jailer? Some plays are so successful that they run for years on end. In many ways, this is unfortunate for the poor actors who are required to go on repeating the same lines night after night. One would expect them to know their parts by heart and never have cause to falter. Yet, this is not always the case. A famous actor in a highly successful play was once cast in the role of an aristocrat who had been imprisoned in the Bastille for 20 years. In the last act, a jailer would always come onto the stage with a letter which he would hand to the prisoner. Even though the noble was expected to read the letter at each performance, he always insisted that it should be written out in full. One night, the jailer decided to play a joke on his colleague to find out if, after so many performances, he had managed to learn the contents of the letter by heart. The curtain went up on the final act of the play, and revealed the aristocrat sitting alone behind bars in his dark cell. Just then, the jailer appeared with the precious letter in his hands. He entered the cell and presented the letter to the aristocrat. But the copy he gave him had not been written out in full as usual. It was simply a blank sheet of paper. The jailer looked on eagerly, anxious to see if his fellow actor had at last learnt his lines. 
The noble stared at the blank sheet of paper for a few seconds. Then, squinting his eyes, he said, The light is dim. Read the letter to me. And he promptly handed the sheet of paper to the jailer. Finding that he could not remember a word of the letter either, the jailer replied, The light is indeed dim, sire. I must get my glasses. With this, he hurried off the stage. Much to the aristocrat's amusement, the jailer returned a few moments later with a pair of glasses and the usual copy of the letter, which he proceeded to read to the prisoner. Lesson 23. One man's meat is another man's poison. Listen to the tape, then answer the question below. What was it about snails that made the writer collect them for his friend on that day in particular? People become quite illogical when they try to decide what can be eaten and what cannot be eaten. If you lived in the Mediterranean, for instance, you would consider octopus a great delicacy. You would not be able to understand why some people find it repulsive. On the other hand, your stomach would turn at the idea of frying potatoes in animal fat, the normally accepted practice in many northern countries. The sad truth is that most of us have been brought up to eat certain foods, and we stick to them all our lives. No creature has received more praise and abuse than the common garden snail. Cooked in wine, snails are a great luxury in various parts of the world. There are countless people who, ever since their early years, have learned to associate snails with food. My friend, Robert, lives in a country where snails are despised. As his flat is in a large town, he has no garden of his own. For years, he has been asking me to collect snails from my garden and take them to him. The idea never appealed to me very much, but one day, after a heavy shower, I happened to be walking in my garden when I noticed a huge number of snails taking a stroll on some of my prize plants. Acting on a sudden impulse, I collected several dozen, put them in a paper bag, and took them to Robert. Robert was delighted to see me and equally pleased with my little gift. I left the bag in the hall and Robert and I went into the living room where we talked for a couple of hours. I had forgotten all about the snails when Robert suddenly said that I must stay to dinner. Snails would, of course, be the main dish. I did not fancy the idea, and I reluctantly followed Robert out of the room. To our dismay, we saw that there were snails everywhere. They had escaped from the paper bag and had taken complete possession of the hall. I have never been able to look at a snail since then. Lesson 24. A Skeleton in the Cupboard. Listen to the tape, then answer the question below. Who was Sebastian? We often read in novels how a seemingly respectable person or family has some terrible secret which has been concealed from strangers for years. The English language possesses a vivid saying to describe this sort of situation. The terrible secret is called a skeleton in the cupboard. At some dramatic moment in the story, the terrible secret becomes known and a reputation is ruined. The reader's hair stands on end when he reads in the final pages of the novel that the heroine, a dear old lady who had always been so kind to everybody, had, in her youth, poisoned every one of her five husbands. It is all very well for such things to occur in fiction. To varying degrees, we all have secrets which we do not want even our closest friends to learn. But few of us have skeletons in the cupboard. The only person I know who has a skeleton in the cupboard is George Carlton, 
and he is very proud of the fact. George studied medicine in his youth. Instead of becoming a doctor, however, he became a successful writer of detective stories. I once spent an uncomfortable weekend which I shall never forget at his house. George showed me to the guest room which, he said, was rarely used. He told me to unpack my things and then come down to dinner. After I had stacked my shirts and underclothes in two empty drawers, I decided to hang one of the two suits I had brought with me in the cupboard. I opened the cupboard door and then stood in front of it, petrified. A skeleton was dangling before my eyes. The sudden movement of the door made it sway slightly, and it gave me the impression that it was about to leap out at me. Dropping my suit, I dashed downstairs to tell George. This was worse than a terrible secret. This was a real skeleton. But George was unsympathetic. Oh, that, he said with a smile, as if he were talking about an old friend. That's Sebastian. You forget that I was a medical student once upon a time.